special counsel Jack Smith scores a major win in his investigation into Donald Trump's handling of classified material. The Washington Post reports that an appeals court ruled Trump attorney Evan Corcoran must provide notes, transcripts and other evidence to prosecutors. The Post goes on to report lawyers for the former president had argued that the material being sought was protected by attorney-client privilege, which in most instances shields any communications between a lawyer and a client. Prosecutors responded, and U.S. District Judge Beryl Howell ultimately agreed, that the crime fraud exception to attorney-client privilege applied in this case. The special counsel has been trying to force Evan Corcoran to testify since mid-February. To be clear, a judge ruled that the special counsel presented sufficient evidence in court that Donald Trump, the former president, committed a crime via his attorney. And of course, this is all happening as we wait for a Manhattan grand jury to decide whether to indict Trump in that other criminal case, the Stormy Daniels hush money case. Two sources tell NBC News that District Attorney Alvin Bragg plans to convene the grand jury again tomorrow. The panel was scheduled to meet today, but that was called off. It's still not clear why. During their last meeting, the jurors heard from a Trump ally named Robert Costello, who was once an advisor to Michael Cohen. The former president's lawyers had hoped Costello would undercut Michael Cohen's testimony. Today, Costello issued a statement in which he advised the Manhattan DA to call a timeout and decide if they can go forward with this case and this witness. Meanwhile, people who have recently visited Mar-a-Lago say there is a war room mentality with the possible indictment looming. What do you think of the differences? Well, I mean, I think there's a few things. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the approach to COVID was, was different. I mean, you know, I would have fired somebody like Fauci. Uh, I think that he got way too big for his britches, and I think he did a lot of damage. Uh, I also think just in terms of my approach to leadership, you know, I get personnel in the government who have the agenda of the people and share our agenda. If you bring your own agenda in, you're gone. Trying to differentiate himself from Donald Trump, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says that he would have fired Dr. Anthony Fauci, something a president doesn't have the power to do, by the way. The Florida governor is also still leaning into culture war issues, a.k.a. bigotry. DeSantis' latest salvo is an attempt at expanding Florida's controversial don't say gay law all the way through high school. It's a move that would not require legislative approval but might help his poll ratings with the GOP base. With us for more, Julian Castro, former HUD secretary and 2020 Democratic candidate for president, and Tim Miller, a contributor to The Bulwark and the former communications director for Jeb Bush. Thank you both for joining me tonight. Tim, Ron DeSantis says he's focused on the people's agenda. But is the stuff he's pushing really popular in Florida or even beyond Florida? In Florida, Disney World, which is supposed to be neutered by the DeSantis regime, just announced it's going to host a huge LGBTQ rights summit this year. Yeah, I was on Alex Wagner's show about a month ago, and I said, you know, if DeSantis goes after Trump, she's, he's going to go after him, him from the, I guess, right or from the conspiracy right uh, on COVID and say that, that he took that Donald Trump took COVID too seriously and that that would be his criticism of him. And here he is doing very, that on Piers Morgan. Everybody thought that would be a ridiculous attack, but that is, that is the upside-down world of this primary. And look, what DeSantis is trying to do, I think your question is, is what he's proposing popular. Well... It's popular among Republican primary voters. It's popular among the MAGA primary voters uh, that he's trying to peel away from Donald Trump. And, and I think yes. this is the conundrum and the paradox that he's in, right? Can he can he can he appeal to those vo folks that are with Trump and, and take them away from him while not turning off the the people that like Disney that don't care that there was a lesbian kiss in the Buzz Lightyear movie, you know, that want to go to Disney World without having politics shoved down their throat? Uh, I, I I don't think so. And that, I think that's the conundrum that he's in right now. Julian, Ron DeSantis, as some of us have been saying for a while, isn't the great candidate he was made out to be. That's very clear. He's not come up with a strategy for resisting Trump's attacks. And the polls suggest Trump is widening his lead over DeSantis right now, particularly among those most likely to vote. Could DeSantis flame out before he even formally announces? No, of course he could. Uh, we saw in 2016 a number of candidates. Tim Pawlenty comes to mind. Uh, who yes. people had high hopes for that Tim who? folks thought. Who? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, I, uh, Jeb Bush flamed out. Uh, a number oh, of people. Oh, come on. <laughs> <all expect. laughs> yeah, nothing personal. Uh, but look, um, there are 320 days until Republicans vote in Iowa. 
as the first contest of the 2024 season. That is a lifetime and more in politics. I mean, these days, two weeks is a lifetime. That's forever. So 320 days for people to go up and down and, and as Tim said, right and left in different ways. And DeSantis really has not been tested as a candidate on a national level. Yes, yeah. he's been successful in Florida. He's trying to set a MAGA-like agenda, trying to buddy up to Donald Trump on the issues as much as he, as he can and really not differentiate himself there. Um, so he has a strategy, but so far that strategy is not holding up well in the face of Trump, uh, who is a master at differentiating himself and his brand from every other candidate. If I were uh, DeSantis, I think what he should lean into is the one thing that Donald Trump can't avoid, and that's electability. Historically, uh, the party out of power starts to concern itself more and more as, it, as the primary gets closer to electability, who can actually beat the opposing party's president that is in office. You know that Trump already lost to Joe Biden once, and all of these indictments and everything else probably is not making it more likely that he can beat him yeah. in 2024. So if I were DeSantis, I would actually lean into electability more directly. I mean, Tim Pawlenty, Jeb Bush, Chris Christie, Scott Walker, a lot of governors who were seen as great white knights and then crashed and burned uh, when it came to the national spotlight, the national stage. Tim, the MAGA wing of the Republican Party keeps saying, they've been saying all week, the prosecuting Trump will be good for Trump politically. It's going to guarantee him re-election. So why aren't they supporting these potential indictments? Why are they so bothered by them? Um, well, you know, that's a little bit of a front, sort of some bravado and a troll. Uh, it, it's, you know, you have to put yourself in this alternate universe. Uh, you know, Julian's over there saying that, well, the electability argument might work for DeSantis. Well, the problem is, is that these MAGA voters have convinced themselves that Donald Trump actually won. So it's no electability yeah. problem. It was stolen from them, right? Uh, the same is true, you know, when it comes to, to the arguments about the, uh, about these indictments, right? I, they're, they're trying to, to create an alternative, uni an alternate universe that is true for them, right? Where, where this is a good thing if he's if he's indicted. The problem is, you know, this very first indictment, conceivably they have an argument to be made. He has six different investigations against him. You know, when, when indictment upon indictment upon indictment is falling down on him, I, like the effect on everyone outside of the cult, I, I don't think that there's enough appreciation among the kind of MAGA political prognosticators about the, about the damage that that's going to cause. Yeah, I mean, it, you really have to live in a topsy-turvy world to say with a straight face that a guy who has multiple potential indictments against him, that's going to help him win the presidency of the United <laughs> States. And if that is the case, then seriously, we really do live in some bizarre alternative universe. Julian, last question to you. So few potential 2024 challengers have even made an official announcement. Are they all scared of Trump? And with the exception of DeSantis, do any of them even have a chance? I mean, Nikki Haley, who's declared, is polling at 3%. Mike Pence and Mike Pompeo, who have yet to declare, are at 1%. It's rather embarrassing. I mean, why would they think that they have much of a chance when you look at the polls and you just put one of the results up and Trump is overwhelmingly ahead. He has greater name ID, much more money, the ability to raise more money, has this base, this very high floor of at least 35% in a primary. And so the more and more crowded it gets, the better it is for him. Uh, so serious candidates, I'm sure, have decided, many of them have decided, look, uh, why not just wait until 2028? And Trump ain't, probably ain't going to be running that year. Uh, and so if they're serious about it, they'll just take a pass on this one. And you know what? Ron DeSantis may ultimately take a pass as, as well. I mean, we haven't seen ultimately whether he's actually going to run. I think it's still yeah. possible that he backs out. He's a young guy. He might bide his time. Tim, if the Republican grandees, if such people even exist anymore, were to come to you in a smoke-filled room, and say, Tim, design for us, pick for us the candidate who can stop Trump, what would you say to them? Uh, could we get a time machine and bring Chris Christie back from, like, 2013 before he was politically damaged, right? Uh, you know, that, someone like that. Um, uh, you know, someone, Tucker, maybe, right? Someone that's from the performance wing. <laughs> I, I, there is no center-right kind of Republican that, could, that can take him on because the base wants 
MAGA. Um, so you would need to combine someone that has some MAGA creds with the ability to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. Um, DeSantis might have the first side, some MAGA creds, but, you know, we're seeing that on the second side, I, I think he's going to come up short. And so who, who could bring both together? I, I, it's, hard to, it's hard to see anyone. There's no way Tucker Carlson would run against Donald Trump because he said this no week way. that he loves Donald Trump. And, of course, we know that's his sincere view. It's not like he's saying in private that he hates Donald Trump. He loves Donald Trump. <laughs> Julian Castro, Tim Miller, thank you both. Banned books and burning books are the same. Both are done for the same reason. Fear of knowledge. Fear is not freedom. Fear is not liberty. Fear is control. The last thing before we go tonight, fear is not freedom. That was 100-year-old Grace Lynn at the Martin County Florida School Board meeting, protesting the removal of books from school libraries. Florida state law allows anyone to challenge a book and recommend school media specialists err on the side of caution when considering whether or not to pull a book from the shelf. Works from Toni Morrison, Jody Pico, Margaret Atwood, Judy Bloom, and even James Patterson are among those axed in Martin County this month. Pan America has counted 84 titles no longer available to kids in the Florida district. And Grace Lynn is having none of it. I want you to listen to a bit more of what she said yesterday. My husband, Robert Nickel, was killed in action in World War II. At a very young age, he was only 26, defending our democracy, constitution, and freedoms. One of the freedoms that the Nazis crushed was the freedom to read the books they banned. They stopped the free press, banned and burned books. The freedom to read which is protected by the First Amendment, is our essential right and duty of our democracy. Even so, it is continually under attack by both the public and private groups who think they hold the truth. Grace Lynn is 100 years old. She lost her husband in the Second World War. She experienced the entirety of the Cold War. And today, she thinks what's happening in Florida is really bad.